Well, welcome back, Family Bible Time. We are still in Daniel. Daniel chapter 4. I haven't actually checked, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be 4, 5, and 6. Um, we got to... Pray and then we'll get started. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we need your help to understand and to rightly interpret your word. We praise you for it and we pray that you would please, um, Lord, speak to us through your word, teach us, help us, give us that power of the Holy Spirit to interpret it rightly. We pray that we wouldn't go astray. We pray that you would help us by the, the leading and guiding of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So Daniel chapter 4, and we are in the thick of Daniel's adventures. King Nebuchadnezzar, this is Nebuchadnezzar's letter now. To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion endures from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. I saw a dream that made me afraid as I lay in bed. The fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. So I made a, tr a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers came in. And I told them the dream, but they could not make known to me its interpretation. At last, Daniel came in before me. He who was named Belteshazzar after the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. I told him the dream, saying, O oh, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and that no mystery is too difficult for you, tell me the visions of my dream that I saw and their interpretation. And you'd think if he really believed all of that, he'd have gone to Daniel first, wouldn't he? Anyway, verse 10. The visions of my head as I lay in bed were these. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong, and its top reached to heaven. It was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful, and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the heavens lived in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in, my be in bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. He proclaimed aloud and said, Thus chop down the tree, and lop off its branches, strip off its leaves, and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it, and the birds from its branches. But leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze, amid the tender grass of the field. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven, let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's, and let a beast's mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. The sentence is by decree of the watchers. The decision 
by the word of the Holy Ones to the end, that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, saw, and you, O Belteshazzar, tell me the interpretation, because all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Do you think maybe he had a clue as to what it was going to be, and he wanted to have a better interpretation than Daniel would have given him? Anyway... Verse 19, then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was dismayed for a while, and his thoughts alarmed him. The king answered and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation alarm you. Belteshazzar answered and said, my lord, may the dream be for those who hate you, and its interpretation for your enemies. The tree you saw, which grew and became strong so that its top reached to heaven, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth, whose leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in which was food for all, under which beasts of the field found shade, and in whose branches the birds of the heavens lived. It is you, O king, who have grown and become strong. Your greatness has grown and reaches to heaven, and your dominion to the ends of the earth. And because the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven, saying, Chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field, and let him be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field, till seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. It is a decree of the Most High, which has come upon my lord the king, that you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven, and seven periods of time shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And you can stick that in your open theistic pipe and smoke it. And as it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree and your kingdom shall be confirmed for you from the time that you know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of twelve months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king answered and said, Is is this not great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? While the words were still in the king's mouth, There fell a voice from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and you shall be made to eat like grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you, until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hair grew as long as eagles' feathers 
and his nails were like bird's claws. At the end of the days, thank you, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High, and praised and honoured him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, What have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me for the glory and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counsellors and my lords sought me, and I was established in my kingdom. Still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honour the King of heaven. For all his words are right, and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Wow, do you remember that? Do you remember that sermon that Pete preached? The Tree Surgeon's Psalm, he called it. Uh, the, tree ch the Tree Surgeon's Sermon. I remember it. An evangelistic sermon based on this chapter. Cut it down. Wow. What a thought that God is able to humble those who walk in pride. Pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Well done, I heard you. Um, it's a scary thing, isn't it? Is this not great Babylon that I have built, said Nebuchadnezzar. Those, those words have gone down as kind of famous last words. It's just before God's judgment fell. Here he is exalting himself. I think it's a great warning. If ever God gives you success, if ever you have blessing from God, and you look, look out at what the Lord has enabled you, it is God who gives the power to make rich, doesn't, isn't, isn't it? That's what the Bible says. It's only God who gives you the gifts. What do you have that you did not receive, the Bible says. And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? That's what James says. So, so here's the thing. If you ever look out at what you have and you're tempted in your mind to boast, hear the words of Nebuchadnezzar and humble yourself quick. Humble yourself before God has to humble you, right? Is this not great Babylon that I have built? Oops. And the judgment fell, didn't it? And God humbled him. Well, there we are. That was Daniel chapter 4, Daniel chapter 5. King Belshazzar. We, we've moved on a few years here, haven't we? So this is about, 20, I think, 20 years later or thereabouts. So Nebuchadnezzar died. There were... Subsequent kings, there was a little bit of toing and froing, but then Belshazzar is actually the sort of regent in Babylon, um, while the the true king was elsewhere. But Belshazzar, here he is, um, in charge when Babylon falls. Belshazzar made a great feast. For a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out from the temple of Jerusalem be brought, and that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. 
Then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out from the, out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood and stone. Immediately the, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall in the king's palace opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. Then the king's colour changed and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way and his knees knocked together. The king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, the astrologers, and the king declared and the wise, to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, I bet they did, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. I always think of them as a little bit like Cinderella's ugly sisters at this point. They must have been desperately trying to get the glass slipper on, or desperately trying to read the writing. It's like, oh, come on, come on, come on, come on, we can read it. Oh, we can't read it. It must have been a bit like that. Because these are all the clever guys, aren't they? They're, they're all the guys who normally, they're the enchanters, the magicians. The, they're the guys that everyone turns to for answers. And here they are, and there's just a little bit of handwriting on the wall. But they can't read it. And they can't give the interpretation. Well, it's interesting. It doesn't seem to be in a that strange a language. Because it's going to be here, but... They couldn't. They could, just couldn't get it, whether God kept them from getting it or whether they were too afraid to give the interpretation. But it does say they couldn't read the writing. So I think it's an element of God kind of just foiling them so that they can't see it. You know, sometimes when um, like someone draws something and it's like a lady's head looking at it one way and then... You look at it another way and it's an old man's, oh, old woman's face. Have you seen that kind of thing? I wonder whether it was something like that and they're looking at it and they're all kind of trying to interpret it one way and just none of them can see it. Right? But I don't know. Anyway, they couldn't read it. An elliptical eruption, yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Oh, you're made out of dots and that sort of thing. Yes, they're, they're fun. Uh, where are we? Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed and his color changed and his lords were perplexed. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall this is probably the queen mother. And this is, Belshazzar was like the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar thereabouts. And the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him the chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans and astrologers, because an excellent spirit, knowledge and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles and solve problems were found in this Daniel Notice she gives Daniel his proper Hebrew name. Now let Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar, now let Daniel 
be called and he will show the interpretation. Do you think she had become a follower of Daniel's God, perhaps, if she was willing to call him Daniel? I like to think so. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king answered and said to Daniel, You are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king, my father, brought from Judah. I have heard of you that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the enchanters, have been brought in before me to read this writing, and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not show the interpretation of the matter. But I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom." Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself, and give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king, and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father kingship, and greatness, and glory, and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared him. Whom he would, he killed, and whom he would, he kept alive, and whom he would, he raised up, and whom he would, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened, so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne. And his glory was taken from him, and he was driven from among the children of mankind, and his mind was made like that of a beast, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, until he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind, and sets over it whom he will. And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, humbled your heart, though you knew all this, but you've lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, and the vessels of his house have been brought in before you, and you and your lords, your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver and of gold of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways, you have not honoured. That's what you call neuthetic confrontation. Uh, By the way, it it is sometimes appropriate to lay it out for someone. And this is called laying it out. This is called accusing somebody of their sin, isn't it? This is definitely not British. (laughs) But it is biblical. Sometimes there are times to just lay it out and to, to say it as it is. Verse 24, then from his presence the hand was sent, and this writing was inscribed. And this is the meaning that was inscribed. Mene, mene, tekel, and parsin. And this is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Takel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed with purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck, 
and a proclama proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. Why the third? Well, remember me saying Belshazzar wasn't actually the head honcho. Belshazzar was second in command in the kingdom. kingdom. And further down south in the, in the kingdom was the, the head honcho king. Uh, so Belshazzar made Daniel the next in command to him. But then what happened? That very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. No mention of how. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years. Darius the Mede, the Medes and the Persians, actually the Medes and the Persians were at the gates. The Medes, Medes and the Persians were camped outside. And this very night, recorded in history, this very night, the Babylonians were so confident in the thickness of their walls and the impregnability of their city that they were drunk and partying, just like the nobles inside the palace. But that very night, Cyrus, the king of the Persians, had arranged for the rivers of the Euphrates, the waters of the Euphrates River to be diverted upstream. And they walked in underneath, they marched in where the water would have been, and they marched into the city and they took the city. And that very night, Darius, uh, Belshazzar rather, was dead, and Darius the Mede became king in Babylon. Darius is, yeah, an, an interesting character. We're going to read about him now in chapter 6. This is. Almost too much exciting story time for one night, isn't it? But should we have some more? You want to hear Daniel on the lion's den? Okay, let's do it. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three presidents, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give account, so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other presidents and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. He would have been about 80 now. Similar age to Grandad. Similar age to John MacArthur. Think about that. Sometimes 80-year-olds can be at the top of their game, can't they? Like John MacArthur. Think about old Daniel now. Suddenly in his old age, they want to make him president over all the others. So he's, going to be, he's, he's one of three, but he's going to become like prime minister. Then the presidents and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful, and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these presidents and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to, the, said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counsellors and the governors, are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever doesn't get vaccinated, no, whoever makes petition to any god or man for thirty days, except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. 
Therefore King Darius signed the document and injunction. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to the streets to join in the protest. No, he didn't. He went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks. It's almost as like he'd been reading Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, give thanks in all circumstances. Three times a day and prayed and give, gave thanks before his God and he ha- as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said to the king and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within thirty days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be rebuked, revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he laboured till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, No, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and the Persians, that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Then the king commanded, Yes. He, I guess he could have made a new law, but he didn't. I mean, Ahasuerus, or Xerxes, when Esther, when they kind of trapped Esther in the same way. So Caris's question is, couldn't they? Couldn't he have made a new law? I guess he could have done. Ahasuerus did, didn't he? he made a new law to allow the Jews instead of because he couldn't repeal the law about the Jews being annihilated and the rest of it but he made a new law to say that they could do it to their enemies and anyone who tried to attack them they could they could basically fight so i guess he could have done but he didn't so simple um then the king commanded and daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions the king declared to daniel May your God, whom you serve, continually deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Then at break of day the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, Live forever, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him, and also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him.
because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions. They, their children and their wives, and before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and during the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Wow, this is exciting stuff, isn't it? Do you believe that God can bring you to the point where it looks desperately bad? It looks like it's all over. It looks like the enemies of God have trapped you and still want you to be faithful. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God could want you to be faithful even to death? Even a horrible death in a, in a den of lions. Do you think God, God could require that of you or me? Think about those believers in Afghanistan at the moment for whom maybe some of them are already being called upon to say to the new powers in Afghanistan, we will not serve your God or bow down to your idol. We won't do it. We'll not stop worshipping God. Not for you, not for anybody. And do you think some of them are losing their lives? Do you think God would even require that kind of faithfulness of us? I'm going to say he does require that kind of faithfulness of us. He wants us to decide in advance, to decide now that we are willing to go as far as we have to go in worshipping him, to be faithful to death. But do you also think, do you think that God could, if he chose to, rescue you even at the last moment and shut the mouths of the lions and turn it around so that your enemies are thrown in instead of you. Yes? So, um, maybe, break the guns. maybe break the guns, maybe hide his people. Maybe take out the bullets. Maybe, <laughs> maybe take out the bullets and make them into blanks. Who knows what God could do? God can do anything, can't he? God can actually, he can actually make miracles happen. And I believe that. So if he does, that's because he wants to. And if he doesn't, that's because he doesn't want to. And if, if you or I were to be martyred, that would be okay. If you really believe that God knows what he's doing. But do you really believe that he can turn it around? What's required of us, of us is faithfulness, isn't it? Faithfulness. I asked you this yesterday. Would you be faithful? Would you be faithful if it was you and you alone standing? Would you be faithful? Lord, please make us faithful like Daniel. Willing to go and pray. 
to trust you for our futures, not to worry about the consequences, but just to be faithful, to pray, to worship, to serve you. We pray that you would give us grace to trust you. And we pray for your people today in Afghanistan and North Korea and other parts of the world where to be faithful costs them their lives, many of them. Oh Lord, be near to them, provide for them, rescue them, we pray. Above all, give them courage and faith and reward them for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, God bless you, little girl. You're on camera duty today. But we will say, God willing, we'll see you tomorrow. We'll be back here for some more of Daniel. I think it's going to get very exciting with Daniel's prophecies now. We've done the first six chapters. We'll be back to do some more tomorrow. God bless you. Bye-bye.